It's the real news. I'm Aaron Matek. The Al-Aqsa compound or Temple Mount in East Jerusalem has long been a flashpoint in the Israel-Palestine conflict. Now there is a new escalation. On Friday, Israel canceled prayers at the Al-Aqsa Mosque for the first time in decades. This came after a gunfight that left three Palestinian gunmen and two Israeli soldiers dead. The Palestinians opened fire on Israeli forces before they were shot dead inside the compound. The mosque has since reopened, but Palestinian worshippers are refusing to enter because Israel imposed new restrictions. Previous tensions at the Al-Aqsa compound have led to deadly clashes, including the protests that launched the Second Intifada in 2000. Dan Cohen is a journalist and filmmaker. He is the director of the upcoming documentary, Killing Gaza. Dan, welcome. Good to be with you, Aaron. Thank you for joining me. Let's talk first about what happened last week. This attack uh, that led to deaths uh, of Palestinians and Israeli soldiers, and then Israel closing Friday prayers at the compound for the first time in decades. Right, so um, three Palestinian citizens of Israel from actually the same family in the northern city of Umm al-Fahim um, opened fire on Israeli occupation soldiers uh, just outside the compound and fled inside the compound. Um, they clashed with other soldiers there and um, were shot and then executed on the spot in a torrent of gunfire. Um, the Israeli occupation uh, canceled Friday prayers for the day, which, as you described in the opening, is, hasn't happened in decades. Um, and instituted, you know, a collective punishment, shutting down the Muslim quarter of the old city for Palestinians. Um, and so you just have bewildered tourists walking through, not knowing what's going on. Um, the following day, the Israelis continued to keep it closed, keep the Al-Aqsa compound closed, um, and then installed um, uh, metal detectors as under the guise of security at the compound. Um, and so it has since been reopened, um, and, and that's basically the point we're at today. The, actually, the, the uh, director of the Al-Aqsa compound, Sheikh Omar Iswani, was arrested, or was detained, um, and a number of Al-Aqsa guards were detained and interrogated, and so that is the situation right now. Um, what's missing from the story, and this is basically, you know, what I've described there is basically what we've, what we've heard in establishment media, which is all correct, but the huge context that is missing, which might explain what precipitated this attack, was that there is a far right, what I would call an apocalyptic right-wing Israeli movement that tours the Al-Aqsa compound under military protection on a daily basis, where they call, where they make explicit threats to destroy the mosques, um, hoping that uh, they will provoke Palestinians to react violently. And um, then the Israeli military will have the pretext to arrest, um, expel, and even kill anyone who resists, um, with the idea that eventually um, Israel will control the entire compound and uh, be able to destroy the mosques and build a temple in its place. Um, so that's basically the missing context that we just do not see in establishment media. And this movement, uh, who are they? Well, the temple movement is basically, um, it comes from religious Zionism, which is, this, it's a fundamentalist uh, ideology um, that the way to what Orthodox, what, you know, what Judaism for thousands of years has understood as Jewish redemption, uh, the building of a temple, but by supernatural means, it was completely forbidden in Orthodox Judaism, um, it would fall from the sky, according to Orthodox Jews, and then we would have like a kingdom, a Jewish kingdom of God. But in Orthodox Judaism, it was completely forbidden. And so what religious Zionism did is kind of take that idea that instead of, you know, God making it happen, we, Jews would essentially become God and make it happen themselves and build it. And so um, it, originally, the whole idea of building the temple was forbidden. But um, over the decades since the advent of Zionism, about you know more than 120 years ago, uh, this idea has slowly, slowly, slowly mainstreamed. And in the past decades, and especially the past couple of years, it has mainstreamed 
into Israeli society as religious Zionist fundamentalists have achieved prominence and really taken over the state. There's been a theocratization um, of the Israeli military, the, the institutions. And so now this movement to destroy the Al-Aqsa compound has, uh, is kind of positioned as the, the tip of the spear in you know, the Zionist project in Israeli society against Palestinians. And it's understood as the way really to expel all Arabs and create you know, this ultimate war to end the uh, Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Um, I, you know, I'll, I'll read off just a quote from the, a, a few quotes from Israeli officials from, first from the temple movement itself, the official body of the temple movement in reaction, in response to this weekend's incident. Uh, they said, we must liberate the temple mount from the murderous Islam and return it to the people of Israel. So that's, that's the kind of fanatical movement, their official statement. And then we have members of parliament echoing that. Member of parliament, Nisan Somiansky expel Arabs from the compound. Deputy Defense Minister Eli Ben-Dahan, expel Arabs from the compound. Member of Parliament Moti Yogev, uh, expel Arabs basically, he didn't say it explicitly, but from the, Western, the West Bank city of Nablus, from the West Bank city of Hebron, from the Al-Aqsa compound. Um, so it's, it's very much mainstreaming in Israeli society and it's extremely dangerous. And Dan, when you talk about them uh, visiting the Al-Aqsa compound under police protection, can you talk about what that looks like and why you think it's provocative to Palestinians? Well, basically, um, you have uh, Israeli settlers surrounded by Israeli soldiers, heavily armed Israeli soldiers, going around the premises of the compound, explicitly, you know, they'll sing chants of, we will build the temple which implies we will destroy your mosque because there's not really room for two. It's an Islamic worship site. It's been that way for about 1,500 years. Um, and uh, so if you go up there and watch these guys, they'll, t they will, they'll also explicitly call for demolishing the mosque. It's anything to provoke. Um, and it's, you know, it's, it's not just my assessment. Actually, um, if you look at what uh, Avi Dichter said in 2008, um, he, when he was the head of the Minister of Internal Security, the Israeli Minister of Internal Security, he said Jewish prayer at the compound um, would serve as a provocation and cause bloodshed. Um, so it's since then, to get an idea of how much it's mainstream, Dichter was one of the MKs who just said uh, we should assert Jewish sovereignty on the, at the Al-Aqsa compound. So it kind of goes to show how this movement has mainstreamed, that he full well knows that it's actually a provocation, but we should do it anyway because it's like a scene as like a populist statement in Israel. Right. And Dan, so on that point, it reminds me of previous incidents uh, at the Al-Aqsa compound or Temple Mount. Uh, in 96, when Netanyahu was serving his first term as prime minister, he authorized the construction of uh, the digging of these tunnels around the site, uh, which angered Palestinian worshipers and sparked deadly clashes. And then, of course, um, much more uh, consequentially, uh, in 2000, uh, when right after the failure of the uh, Camp David peace talks in the summer of 2000, tensions were very high. And in the fall, you have Ariel Sharon, um, uh, the former IDF commander and prime minister, visiting the Al-Aqsa compound under police protection that sparked the clashes that set off the Antifada. Yeah, exactly. It's, I mean, it's long been, um, it's the most sensitive spot in the country and has impact on the region as well. So we've seen time and time again that um, it, it has, you know, it's kind of like the, the, the Dome of the Rock. The Golden Dome is like the big, they see it as the big golden button to really set it all off. And so, you know, they continue to go and set up sparks. And as you said, we've seen in 96 with Netanyahu's opening of the Western Wall Tunnels and then Ariel Sharon storming the compound with uh, hundreds of soldiers surrounding him and helicopters overhead. It's not as if these settlers are going up there and saying, you know, let's have some kind of peaceful anything. They make their intentions very, very clear to the Palestinians up there. It's, it's really no secret to, uh, you know, to, to Palestinians. 
And Dan, so let's talk about what's happening right now. Uh, Netanyahu has announced new restrictions on the site. Uh, there are security cameras now uh, and also uh, metal detectors. And Palestinians, as I mentioned, have been protesting this, refusing to enter and actually praying uh, outside, re refusing to uh, go inside and say their prayers. But can Israel say we're only doing this in response to the fact that these Palestinian gunmen opened fire and killed our soldiers? Well, I mean, Israel has, um, you know, uh, uh, an agreement with the Jordanians as, as part of the peace agreement with the Jordanians um, that uh, part of that is the uh, Israel coordinates everything with the uh, Mus Muslim religious endowment at the Al-Aqsa compound called the Waqif. Um, and Israel does not really have the power to um, make these unilateral decisions. And so um, it's, it's not exactly surprising that Palestinians are protesting that because it is, again, it's an Islamic worship site. Um, the, the arrangement has been that Jews and not, that, not, that non-Muslims are allowed to visit but are not allowed to worship there. Um, and so uh, Israel really doesn't have any right to the place. It's still, it's occupied territory and it's, you know, an illegal military occupation despite the agreements with the Jordanians. Um, and so, uh, yeah, we see that Palestinians are resisting by um, refusing to, to uh, go through the metal detectors. And, um, and, you know, one of the really crazy things is uh, an Israeli member of Knesset took one of these photos of Palestinians doing a, a prayer in protest in front of the metal detectors. And in the photo, they're, they're, uh, they're you know, on the ground praying in front of the Israeli soldiers, and he said, you know, they're bowing down to the Israeli sh soldiers as they should. I'm paraphrasing, but that's essentially what he sh said. And this, and he's talking in the terms of this is what should happen in the theocracy when they build the temple that, that they want, um, that Arabs will bow down to, to Jews. This is kind of the, you know, the ISIS-like mentality that uh, is taking over. Dan, uh, so finally, can you talk, you mentioned Jordan, so can you talk about what regional implications this whole uh, escalation has, and what you expect to see going forward is now Palestinians are gathering and protesting at this very sensitive site? Well, I mean, the, the first thing is that we're going to see, uh, this is kind of the beginning of Israel implementing the model that it established or that it used in Hebron in terms of after um, uh, extreme, extreme violence. In 1994, um, after the uh, massacre in the Ibrahimi Mosque in Hebron by the Brooklyn-born settler Baruch Goldstein, Israel partitioned the mosque and said, okay, it's, uh, not, you know, now we have to allow um, these settlers to have equal rights as, as Palestinians, even though it's a Palestinian area. Um, and at the same time, turned the old city of Hebron into a ghost town. And so if you go to Hebron now, it's kind of one of the most shocking, um, you know, forms of apartheid, of Israeli apartheid that you'll see. And so that is what's gradually happening in Jerusalem. Now, how that will affect the, um, and it's actually, that has been talked about in the Knesset, implementing that um, that strategy uh, in, in Jerusalem. And we saw, you know, on, on Friday and Saturday, uh, the old city shut down. Um, now, but in Dan, terms of no, what I will happen... Say, Dan, I should say, at least in public, Netanyahu says he's committed to the status quo. Right, I mean, he says that in the same way he says he's committed to the peace process. The status quo continues to change under Netanyahu. More and more, we see restrictions on Palestinian uh, worship, um, freedom of worship at the Al-Aqsa compound, and expansion of settler, uh, you know, basically settler visits to the compound. So it's really just paying lip service. Um, well, the reality on the ground is that the status quo is, you know, more or less becoming meaningless. Um, and the regional context, then? The regional context is this is uh, a crucial part of Israel's agreement with Jordan. Um, and Israel's agreement with Jordan has, you know, what is euphemistically termed security coordination as well. Um, so, of course, there are millions of Palestinians who would love to return home to Palestine um, that, 
Jordan essentially prevents for Israel, and is and Jordan is also an ally of the U.S. and Israel in Syria, and so um, uh, the Israelis do not, you know, really want to turn um, Jordan against, uh, you know, against their interests in Syria. Um, as they kind of continue, Israel, you know, announced yesterday it re it's rejecting a ceasefire as if it has that right. Um, so, so it's really kind of, you know, it's up to Netanyahu what happens from this point out, but um, it's, you know, kind of remains to be seen. But I think in the long term, we're going to kind of see the eventual segregation uh, and partition of the Al-Aqsa compound, which could spark mass, mass clashes. Actually, there were, there were protests yesterday here in Amman. Um, you know, saying we are all responsible for the Al-Aqsa compound. And so the Jordanian government is forced to make, you know, a statement um, condemning Israeli actions there. So uh, it's, it's, Israel's really rocking the boat. And just to clarify that uh, for people in terms of the ceasefire in Syria, uh, Dan's referring to the uh, U.S.-Russia negotiated ceasefire in southwestern Syria, which Israel has rejected because it says that it's empowering Iran. Uh, Dan Cohen, we'll leave it there, though, independent journalist and filmmaker, director of the upcoming documentary, Killing Gaza. Dan, thanks a lot. Thanks for having me. And thank you for joining us on The Real News.